Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to an EAS Consulting Group webinar on verification testing for supplements. It's presented by EAS Independent Consultant, Dr. Steve Cameron. EAS is a member of the certified group of companies. We are a global leader in regulatory solutions for industries regulated by FDA. Our network of over 200 independent advisors and consultants enable, enables EAS to provide comprehensive consulting, training, and auditing services, ensuring proactive regulatory compliance. From strategic product development, GMP compliance, assistance with labeling, and more, EAS offers the detailed knowledge and experience that your company requires. Today's presenter is Dr. Steve Cameron. Dr. Cameron focuses on quality assurance in manufacturing, research, and development. Prior to consulting, he spent his career at the Procter & Gamble Company, overseeing quality assurance and quality control in plants across six continents. He has had direct oversight in areas such as formulation, process engineering, and technical services. Dr. Cameron received his doctorate in pharmaceutical science from the University of Cincinnati. During the webinar, you may ask any questions by typing them into the questions box. We will save all questions for the end, and you should have received your copy of the slide handouts about 30 minutes ago. With that, I will say thank you for joining us, and I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Cameron. Well, thank you, Amy, and let me add my good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on the seminar. We'll be talking today about a topic that is unique to the dietary supplement industry. That is the regulatory exemption of release testing of selected dietary ingredients under specific situations. However, the nature of that exemption and how to justify that exemption can be and is misunderstood and misapplied by those in the industry. I hope I leave you today with a better grounding in what is expected and required. So let's start today with getting grounded in the regulatory requirements. The dietary supplement GMPs found in Title 21 of the CFR, Part 111, are explicit about what finished dietary supplement specifications and verification testing are required. Specifically, Section 111.75 states that you must, one, verify that your finished batch of dietary supplements meet product specifications for identity, strength, purity, and composition. You must also conduct appropriate tests or examinations to determine compliance with those specifications. Third, provide adequate documentation of your basis for determining that compliance with those specifications will ensure that your product meets specifications for identity, strength, purity, and composition. And finally, your quality control personnel must uh, review and approve this documentation. So that's all pretty clear. Now, um, before we go further, I do want to make one sidebar comment. You'll notice in uh, uh, 11175, it states for a subset of dietary supplement batches. This mention of subset raises the concept of reduced testing. In other words, that the FDA permits under certain circumstances that not all batches be tested against every specification. This is actually a different topic than today's discussion of exempted testing. And it's really worthy of its own webinar. If there is interest in the concept of reduced testing, we at EAS are prepared to discuss this in a future webinar. Just let us know and either let uh, uh, EAS know directly or let us know in the feedback. So the concept of today's discussion is exempted testing and is given in 111.75D, which states, and I'm going to paraphrase a little here because it's a long paragraph, you may exempt one or more of specifications from verification requirements if you determine and document that the specifications you select are not able to verify that the system is producing a dietary supplement that meets exempted product specifications and there is no scientifically valid method at the finished batch stage. You must document why, for example, any component testing, examination, or other information will ensure that that specification is met. And then in D2, 
it states that your quality control personnel must review and approve the documentation under paragraph D1. So there's a lot of requirements and discussion in this section which are often misunderstood or frankly poorly applied. So we'll be unpacking those uh, dis uh, elements today in our discussion. So um, why do we care? Uh, so as background, the FDA has been holding the industry accountable to the compliance of good manufacturing practices surrounding specifications. Since 2013, there have been over 550 warning letters that cite the absence of or improper specifications. Now, admittedly, a large portion of those historical warning letters have involved the complete failure to establish adequate specifications. The good news is that the industry is improving in compliance. As it does so, FDA has also been reinforcing other elements of their expectations and requirements. FDA warning letters have incorporated the failure to appropriately exempt those specifications. Now in the industry, this is commonly known as verifying the strength of the ingredient by input. Uh, or in other words, because I added it, claiming the strength of an ingredient solely by input is deemed unacceptable. So let's look at a warning letter from just a few months ago. You can see it's from last August. In this warning letter, FDA stated that the company failed to verify that the finished batches of a variety of their products met specifications because verification was based on production input rather than any type of analytical testing of the finished product. The FDA goes on to make a position statement about the suitability of by input claims. So you need to remember that any warning letter is heavily vetted by the attorneys and management at FDA to ensure that the wording is representative of FDA's current policy. And therefore this wording in this is quite intentional. So let's take a look at some of the key elements of the text of the warning letter. The FDA first states that the input of a dietary ingredient alone is not sufficient to verify its specifications for identity, purity, strength, and composition in a finished product. And the word alone here is actually quite important. Then the FDA chooses to emphasize that addition is a manufacturing step and is not a test or verification which is specified by the regs and is therefore inadequate to assure the presence and strength of the ingredient in a batch. So does this mean that you need to establish an analytical test and generate a result for every single dietary ingredient in every one of your batches? Not necessarily. But it does put the industry on notice that saying by input alone as a verification is both inadequate inappropriate, and inappropriate. So the key really to understand what's required here is to interpret section 111.75d, which we will then now do. So let's unpack this 111.75d. As mentioned, 111.75d permits an exemption if you cannot verify that a specification is met and that no scientifically valid method exists to do so. So the first requirement is to establish whether a scientifically valid method exists. 111.75 goes on to state that in such a situation, it is required that you document why other tests and examinations will ensure that the exempted specifications are met and that the quality unit must review and approve the documentation of this. So the second requirement is to determine what other testing, inspection, and or documentation can ensure that the exempted specification is met. And the third and final requirement is that this rationale be documented, reviewed, and approved, and then retained by your quality unit. Let's start with a discussion of the first requirement around scientifically valid methods. 
As you may recall, the dietary supplement GMPs do not require validated methods, as do pharma GMPs, but rather scientifically valid methods. Actually, 111 does not specify what is a scientifically valid method, but it's given in the preamble to the GMPs. In the preamble, a scientifically valid method is defined as one that is shown to be one, accurate. In other words, it gives a true test result. Secondly, precise, a method that proves, provides re reproducible test results. Third, specific, has the ability to assess an analyte in the presence of other components that may be present. Finally, rugged. Consistently, uh, a rugged method consistently does what is intended to do when conducted under actual use conditions with different analysts, equipment, instruments, chemicals, and standards. Now, there is no prescription on how each of these parameters are met and it's left to method developers and how to do this and those that are, that are skilled in method development. But today's discussion focuses instead on what to do when no scientifically valid method exists. Of course, we could discuss how to develop valid uh, scientific methods, but it's outside of today's discussion. Again, if this is something that is of interest to you, please let EAS know and we can set something up. Now the exemption of um, in 111.75 stipulates that you establish that a scientifically valid method does not exist. What situations actually might cause this not to occur and how does it relate to the requirements of being scientifically valid? One such common situation is the dietary ingredient is such a small constituent of the dietary product and is therefore below the level of quantification, quantitation of the method when in the diet, finished dietary product. Therefore, the resulting method is either inaccurate or not specific. A second situation is that the dietary uh, ingredient method does have a level of quantitation at the levels in the dietary product. However, the presence of other components causes the method to fail. For example, by having the analyte be obscured in the chromatogram uh, by other constituents. In this case, the method is not sufficiently precise. Finally, you may find that the results may not be reproducible when run under different conditions with different operators or in different equipment. In this, these cases, the method is not rugged. In all of these cases, you must demonstrate that any ethical method does not meet the requirements. Of course, cost and complexity of a suitable method is not a justification for not having a method. Now, botanical ingredients actually pose an interesting complexity here as well. Uh, and it really comes down to what you claim. And what you claim can actually lead to exemptions of analytical testing. The first situation in which uh, is one in which you claim the presence of the botanical ingredient as a dietary ingredient, not a constituent, within that dietary ingredient. The classic, classic example, and it's one that's mentioned actually in the uh, preamble, is the claim of the presence of rose hips rather than the vitamin C within the rose hips. Is no method likely exist for the presence of the totality of rose hips, this uh, claim and this verification is subject to exemption. A similar situation exists with proprietary blends. Again, you cannot physically measure the presence of a blend. And so that also is uh, subject to exemption. Regardless, you are expected to document the bases for the absence of a scientifically valid method and have your quality control unit review and approve this. Nevertheless, the absence of a scientifically valid method alone is insufficient to exempt you from the requirements of testing. 111.75 states that you must document why, for example, any component and in-process testing, examination or monitoring, 
or any other information will ensure that such exempted uh, product specifications are met without finished product verification through periodic testing of the finished batch. The manufacturer actually has at their disposal a wealth of data to do this already. And some of this includes things such as raw material testing, warehouse controls, master formula, master manufacturing and batch production records, in-process testing, and other finished product testing. And most of those all exist already. You just need to put them together into a rationale. And so we will discuss each one of these. Uh, the manufacturer has at their disposal really a lot of data uh, that is necessary to support the exemption based upon raw material testing. Specifically, the manufacturer should be testing the dietary ingredient to confirm that the ingredient meets the quality uh, requirements of identity, strength, purity, and composition at the time of dispensing. This is particularly true if one makes a strength claim based on the chemical composition. Further, you should have expert and retest procedures in place. These establish that the dietary ingredient will meet quality uh, requirements during its lifetime uh, in the warehouse. Collectively, these elements build the justification to provide assurance that the exempted dietary ingredient met quality requirements at the time of dispensing. Warehouse controls also provide the manufacturer with assurance that the dietary ingredient and the finished dietary product will meet the necessary requirements for quality in the absence of final verified testing. These include things such as proper identification of the name, item number, lot and x-ray, which prevents mix-ups and assures the strength when it's added. Storage conditions in the warehouse, ensuring that there are the appropriate conditions to uh, prevent loss of strength over time. And then warehouse controls to prevent cross-contamination, microorganisms, uh, pest, filth, other materials from human contact, et cetera, from intruding upon the product. Now you certainly have a formulation in place and the formulation master manufacturing record and the executed batch record provides additional assurance that the accepted specification is met without testing. The original formulation is established to ensure that the exempted dietary ingredient is to be present in the batch with the appropriate overage to uh, overcome any manufacturing uh, variability. By the way, one of the things I've seen before is that um, people add um, overages for things that they measure and don't add overages for things that they exempt, which is probably a tip off. Uh, why would you add overages for things that uh, might have manufacturing variability and choose not to do it for things that you can't measure? That would probably be a red flag to the FDA. Now the subsequent master manufacturing record does provide assurance that uh, this uh, material is to be added on every single batch. And then the executed batch record provides documentation that the exempted dietary ingredient was dispensed and then subsequently added to the batch. This is the by input portion, which again is supportive, but is not, uh, near, not nearly supportive uh, strong enough to do so alone. One should also assess whether any in-process degradation is uh, occurring and whether that needs to be covered by additional overages uh, to ensure that it doesn't affect the quality parameters of the product. So although you have demonstrated in, uh, that scientifically valid methods do not exist for the dietary product in the finished dietary product, there may be in-process testing approaches that provide additional assurances. For example, you might be able to apply physical tests such as appearance, moisture, density, or particle size, which may give you insight to the presence or lack thereof of the exempted dietary ingredient. Most obvious might be the appearance of botanical ingredients in the end process blend. Moreover, you should consider whether those chemical tests, which you found not to be scientifically valid in the finished dietary supplement, may actually be scientifically valid 
when used in process. For example, for low level ingredients that fall below the level of quantification in the finished product, you might actually be able to establish assurance by verifying by assay in a pre-blend where it is uh, not nearly as diluted as in the finished product. For methods that lack precision due to interference with other components, you might be able to establish uh, assurance by assaying the dietary ingredient before the addition of the interferment materials. You may also consider on both of these topics to alter your manufacturing blend such that you can actually do that and uh, uh, assay them and verify their presence earlier in the process. So you can also modify the manufacturing process to allow your exempted uh, uh, your non-scientifically valid methods to work as an in-process assay. Now, one can indirectly provide assurance of the strength, purity, identity, and composition of an exempted dietary ingredient uh, with other finished product testing. For example, the presence of other components that are chemically similar to the exempted dietary ingredient does lend credence to the presence and stability of the dietary ingredient in your process. So if something breaks down in a similar pathway and you measure it in the finished product and you find that it's uh, there and hasn't decomposed, that would suggest that your exempted material has not done so. Secondly, the presence of a component added at the same manufacturing step as your exempted dietary ingredient lends credence that the batch was, uh, the batch record was followed and the ingredient was added. The prevent, uh, presence of components with similar concentration as your exempted dietary ingredient lends credence to the, the, to the fact that segregations and losses in manufacturing did not uh, risk the presence and uniformity of your exempted dietary ingredient. And finally, the extensive testing of your batch uh, to your remaining quality ingredient parameters provides assurance that your batch was made as expected. But if none of the above is documented, according to, to uh, the rules of the GMPs, it didn't happen, right? So the FDA expects in 111.75D that your exemption rationale be documented and reviewed and approved by your quality unit. The first step in the documentation is to create an overarching SOP that establishes your firm's approach to establishing an exemption. This becomes applicable to each and every exempted dietary ingredient and product. This SOP should establish that a white paper be created to document why, in the absence of a finished product testing, other tests and examinations will ensure that the exempted specifications are met. But unfortunately, one size does not fit all and across your portfolio of products. So a single white paper is unfortunately not likely sufficient. For example, a scientifically valid method for a given dietary ingredient may exist for one product, but not another. Perhaps the levels, uh, the levels of that ingredient are different and such would explain a different level of quantification. Additionally, your manufacturing steps, in-process controls, and examinations may differ between your different dietary ingredients and processes, so you have different supporting data. Therefore, you may require a white paper for each combination of dietary ingredient and dietary product. Again, this white paper must be reviewed and approved by your quality unit and should include details specific to your product, such as product description, formulation, and references to manufacturing records and specifications, the, specif uh, the specific exempted specifications, and the discussion of the work done to establish that there is no scientifically valid method or references thereto. Should also include detailed discussion of the rationale why, in the absence of finished product testing, other tests and examinations will ensure that the exempted specifications are met. These might include, as we've discussed, dietary ingredient testing, warehouse controls, 
documentation of the formulation and overages, manufacturing controls in the master manufacturing, manufacturing record and executed batch record, in process testing, and any relevant finished product testing. By the way, I would recommend that rather than saying by input on your specifications, the way to do it is to say exempted by SLP and then list this SLP. That way you're not saying that uh, you're just doing it by input, that you've got an SOP that supports it, and then the white paper's behind that. So in summary, in order to exempt a dietary ingredient from finished product testing, one must complete three steps. First, determine whether a scientifically valid method exists to support the exempted specification. And number two, Determine what other testings, examinations, or other information can, be, can ensure that the exempted specification is met. And then finally, document and retain this uh, and obtain quality unit approval of uh, your rationale. Again, the justification of uh, testing exemption by input alone is never appropriate. It should be exempted by SOP and by the supporting white paper. So I hope this webinar has provided you with additional approaches to verifying the quality of your dietary ingredients in, in your dietary supplements. Thank you very much for your time. And at this point, I think we will open it up to questions. So Amy, I'm gonna let you, uh, if you're there, to pitch me the questions. Absolutely, I am here. And we do have some questions already uh, entered. If you have any yourself, you're welcome to type them into the Q&A box or into the chat. Um, so we will start with uh, the question, does, does high method variability mean that a method is not considered rugged? Uh, good question. Uh, you should establish what your success is, criteria is for method development, and there should be a, uh, that is a limit um, in your SOP on method development that says the method has to be reproducible to this percentage. If you find that the method variability is too high, the method is not precise. And that is a justification for not having a scientific method. But I think what's important there is to predate that with your own internal standards of what good looks like uh, in terms of method variability, and then establish that the method does not meet that criteria. All right, great, thank you. How can we determine whether a scientifically valid method exists or not for assaying an ingredient in a finished product? Uh, well, you should, uh, there should be methods available in the uh, AOAC that may be available in the industry and may be available in the USP. So I would start with those existing methods and seek to apply them. Uh, I don't think you need to create new methods or go to the end of the earth to create new to the world methods when you've uh, tried to establish one and shown that existing methodologies do not work. So the first place to start is what is given in the various literature for those ingredients. Another great place to start would be with your raw material suppliers because they will have methods for that ingredient to release it. So I would contact them to obtain the methods that they use and then seek to apply it. Or if you don't have that ability, contract it out to a, a method firm to see if they can uh, use that method or not. Thank you. Uh, next question is based on batch record acceptable instead of by input on the finished product testing specification? Uh, I would, uh, again, batch record is one of the many elements because you should have double signatures for the addition of the dietary ingredient, but it's mentioned that alone is not enough. Um, so it's a wording change, um, but I think you need to look at all the other things we talked about today and build that into your database of here's other things that I could use uh, to demonstrate that um, the exempted specification is met. And I wouldn't, uh, for wording, I would exempt, instead of saying by input or by batch record, I would say exempted by SOP whatever, the SOP number that you choose to, uh, to create that covers exempted specifications. 
So wording wise, I wouldn't do it by batch record, I'd do it by SOP. And then secondly, just batch record alone, as we've discussed, is not going to be deemed uh, sufficient. It's supportive, but not sufficient. Great, thank you. Next question, if a product is a single ingredient dietary supplement, and they use the example of uh, creatine monohydrate, must one test the finished product for creatine monohydrate? Uh, yes, it's required uh, that you need to have finished product. Um, so there's if there's no excipients, uh, nothing else, you, you still are processing it and turning it into a finished product and the regs require that you have a finished product assay. So yes, you do need to have a, a appropriate specifications for strength, purity, identity, and composition and test the finished product. And is it appropriate to not test an ingredient because it is not tied to a structure function claim? Uh, if you claim the pre structure function claim is one that uh, would uh, you would uh, claim in your marketing or on your label. But if you're claiming the presence of that dietary ingredient on your SFP, so if you're claiming a certain amount of a vitamin or something else, you still need to test for that ingredient. And if you do not, then it is not a dietary ingredient, it's a dietary component. And it uh, is an inactive ingredient. All right, thank you. Uh, if you were dealing only with a single ingredient botanical, can you write one overarching SOP for all products or do you need to create individual white papers for each product? So one overarching SOP that covers them. And, it, and again, use your judgment on white papers. You just wanna make sure that the white paper you, you create uh, would cover the variability of what you have. You don't, uh, the FDA does not specify how many white papers, they don't specify white papers at all. This is a recommendation, uh, but just use your judgment on whether you believe that a single white paper would be sufficient to cover the breadth of your different products and uh, materials. And uh, another person asks, if you can explain a little bit more about what purity covers, is it only micro testing? No, it would be uh, uh, any, uh, anything that you believe could be introduced in your process that would uh, create uh, something that would uh, harm the, the integrity of the product. So in addition to micro, it could be heavy metals, for example. Uh, again, look at your process and say, where might we be introducing some materials that would be foreign to the product and it should be tested for that. A great place to start would be what are the uh, raw material uh, specifications that you have and what type of uh, uh, purity uh, specifications you have on each of your raw materials. But heavy metal, pesticides, um, uh, micro would be the three primary areas that you should consider. Thank you very much. And uh, next question, how many results do you need to prove there is no valid method available? Do you need to test them in different laboratories? So uh, again, I would, uh, you should have an SOP or a standard internal to your company that says, this is what we define as a scientifically valid method. Uh, pharma has it done by, I believe it's USP, defines what, what is a uh, scientifically or a validated method. But you there is nothing like that for the nutritional supplements or dietary supplement industry. So you need to establish for yourself what a good method is. There may be things you can use in literature from USP as a starting point. Establish that first. And once you determine that you cannot meet that, it's really up to you how many times you need to fail or attempt, um, uh, but establish what good looks like for a method first and then determine whether or not you meet it. And can you explain a little bit more about testing herbs? Is it not mandatory to test all herbs? Uh, I, I guess um, my question is, do you need to test for the, pre you need to test the herb raw material coming in, but there's no physical way to, let's say you're adding thyme physically or oregano to your finished product. How does one, quantify the amount of oregano in that finished capsule, 
tablet, whatever, there's really no good way to do that. So you're not necessarily expected to quantify the amount of an herb if you claim just that herb. But if you claim a constituent of that herb, an example uh, would be, um, uh, again, we talk rose hips and vitamin C in the preamble. If you're claiming vitamin C rather than rose hips, you do need to quantify that because a method does exist for vitamin C. Okay, thank you. And how are you determining appropriate overages if you are not conducting stability testing on the input ingredient? Well, uh, one, you should uh, establish, uh, the, the starting point would be what is your weight variability of your finished product? So you have a standard for a uh, lot to lot vari or sample to sample variability. That would be the minimum threshold for overages because you would expect at times to go up or down on that weight variability and you need to cover that range with the concentration of that material. So secondly, you should be cons doing um, stability testing on that material if there is a method that exists for it. So only if there's an exempted material, uh, exempted method, would you not do that? Uh, but you should ex expect um, to be doing some type of stability. You could also use your raw material stability data as a surrogate. So if I were faced with that situation where I was claiming a certain amount of something in uh, an exempted material, I would look at my raw material stability and what I would expect over shelf life loss uh, in, the, in just the raw material. And then I would look at my weight variability. I would add those two together and that would be my overage. Is there an industry standard for acceptable test method variability? I don't know of an industry standard. I'd have to look into that. Um, certainly, uh, that's something that we could uh, reach into, but I know various companies have established what uh, their success criteria is for precision, accuracy, ruggedness, and specificity of methods. So uh, when I worked at P&G, our own analytical department wrote their own white paper uh, that established this is the, the standards that we will apply to. Uh, whether those are publicly available, we'd have to look into something like the AOAC, um, the uh, Association of Analytical Chemists. Our next question is regarding exporting supplements to the U.S. And the question is, is there an FDA requirement to test every finished product batch of a supplement? Or can you do one out of six? Or can it be periodic testing? What is acceptable? So that is the uh, discussion we raised earlier um, around um, reduced testing. And so um, there is an expectation that every lot will be tested for something, but once you build up a database and you write your own SOP and your own procedures that provides assurance that you reproducibly meet all of your specifications on all batches, you can, implement a reduced uh, testing procedure that would allow you to uh, not test every single ingredient on every batch. Uh, I would not recommend that you not test anything on a batch, um, but you may reduce it and only test certain ingredients. It should be done in a round table approach and you must be doing it at least once a year uh, to test everything. Again, that's something that's really worthy of its own separate um, webinar, seminar, uh, contact DES and we can help you with that, but um, uh, there are some nuances on how to implement uh, reduced testing. Uh, thank you. And uh, next question is phys physiological absorption testing part of exemptions so that a consumer can rely uh, on what it, on it, that his body is getting what is on the label? Um, I don't know that physiological um, exempt, uh, testing or, or physiological data would be used by the FDA. Uh, the FDA generally draws a pretty solid wall between absorption of, of any drug and quality parameters, uh, unless you have what's called an in vitro and vivo correlation, 
So I would not go down the road of attempting to use physiological data to support a quality parameter unless you have exhaustive data uh, called in, in vivo in vitro co uh, uh, correlation, which is pretty hard to do. Uh, there's something in the USP that is applied to pharma. Not many companies do it either, uh, but I would not use that data. You're starting to go down a, a path that the FDA could uh, take issue with. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just a note to Sean, I just saw your question and we will um, have someone reach out to you regarding reduced testing requirements. <clears throat> excuse me, PK, or PK, excuse me, I see your question on testing laboratories and uh, I can put you in touch with Certified Laboratories, which is a, a partner organization of EAS to see if they offer the testing that you're looking for. Next question, can 95% confidence interval be used as a surrogate me for measurement uncertainty if the sample size is, if the sample size to determine the MU is too small? Uh, could you repeat that, Amy, the last phrase, if uh, something's too small? Uh, can a 95% 95 confi confidence interval be used as a surrogate for measurement uncertainty if the sample size to determine the MU is too small? The MU. Oh, the mu. Okay. Um, measurement uncertainty. Measure, yeah. So again, it goes back to I would establish um, your own internal standard. 95% is a good one. Um, uh, but I would establish your own internal standards on what a method variability level is acceptable. 95% um, confidence is obviously good. Uh, and that's be a place to start. I hope I understood the question right. Uh, but I would document that in an SOP and then apply that to all of your subsequent method development exercises. We have another question with regards to new vitamin formats, such as gummies, where specific methods are not yet validated. Um, will buy input work in this specific case? Uh, well, again, it's up to you as the developer to establish that the method is scientifically valid or not. So I, I don't know, um, uh, you, you should seek to apply the, um, whatever you can find in the industry, AOAC, um, uh, other places that have established methods for the constituents in your gummies. And if you find that they do not work, that is a rationale to go down and start the process of exemptive testing. But again, don't use the by input words. You need to do all the things that are in that are discussed today to establish a rationale um, of why that uh, method is exempted, but you still meet your quality requirements. Thank you. And what does strength mean in the context of a botanical ingredient? Uh, well, strength would be uh, of a botanical ingredient would be the milligrams of herb per unit. And again, since there's no method to assure uh, the uh, amount of milligrams of rose hips or thyme or any other botanical ingredient, uh, that is subject to exemption. But it would be the quantity that you expect in each dosage or each um, serving of your nutritional supplement. If a supplier does not have a method of analysis for the bioactive of interest, nor any laboratories, can this be exempted from testing? Uh, that would be if the supplier doesn't have it and you've done your homework to look through the industry to say that uh, it does not exist in the industry, then you could start this whole process of exempted testing because uh, the FDA will not expect you to, to uh, uh, spend the treasury on uh, seeking to develop a method where one does not exist today. Um, but uh, that would be a starting point to go down this process. How far does the scope of proprietary blend extend to exempt products with multiple actives like anti, like anxiety gummies containing many plant extracts and some vitamins blended in a specific ratio? So it depends what you claim. Uh, so for proprietary blends, if you're claiming the presence of a blend, 
It's just like a botanical. We're claiming the presence of the blend itself. That itself cannot be measured directly, the presence of a blend, just like you cannot measure the presence of, you cannot quantify the mass of an herb in the, in the serving. Uh, however, if you, you are what you claim, and if you're not claiming the presence of the proprietary blend, but a constituent within that blend, then you need to measure that constituent and you're no longer under, falling under the proprietary blend requirements. If we perform purity testing on a dietary ingredient and or finished product, can the same test results be used for identity specification? If you're for a raw material, I'm assuming here. Um, so if the methods are the same, uh, so I'm assuming you're saying we do a test to measure purity of an ingredient. Can I use it for strength, for example, for that same raw material or finished product? If the methods are, are appropriately scientifically valid for both quantifications, identity and strength, uh, yes. Um, the, um, uh, but you would need to ensure that it is, it is uh, quantifiable in the range that you're doing. Do these types of exemptions work generally? Uh, does these types of exemption work generally get owned by R&D and approved by quality or does quality tend to write the white papers and SOPs? It varies by company. I mean, um, and so uh, in, in my world, um, R&D uh, would do the justification of what is sufficient and quality control would, um, would review and approve that. Uh, that uh, will be different in different companies in terms of what the scopes and responsibilities of the different companies are. It needs to be done by one skilled in the art, but what organization they fall under uh, would, be, would be separate. Now, having said that, you need to have somebody approve what was done by whoever developed it. So it should not be the person that wrote it in quality also approves it in quality. So it would need to be two separate people within that organization. But in small companies, quality and R&D can be the same people. Is there any specific suitable method for estimating filth? Yeah. Well, I would, uh, filth is, is a broad term that the FDA uses. So uh, it, contamination is typically um, uh, going to be micro. It's going to be heavy metals. It's going to be pesticides. But it can also be foreign materials that are optically visible. So if you see some foreign materials in there, then you would pick up a visual test for that one. Uh, so for particles or other things that are coming in, twigs or something else. But most of that would be a visual technique and examination. For probiotic pills, are there any requirements to confirm that there are no other microorganisms present than stated on the label? I need to confirm that there's no other harmful ingredients in there. I have to say that uh, probiotics fall into a gray space in the regs because they're not explicitly uh, listed under uh, what the FDA defines as a dietary supplement, but they're often treated as such. Um, but uh, you need to demonstrate that there's no harmful bacteria that are in there. Uh, I certainly would want to understand what other materials would be getting in there to ensure that they're not harmful. But you don't, if you've already established that the other ingredients are not harmful, then there's no reason to quantify those. Thank you. Uh, the next question is periodic qualifying and verifying a quality step that is still needed when using exemption as a method on the specification. Periodic. Uh, Qualifying and verifying. Is yes. A... Yes. So if it's exempted and you've written a white paper about it to say that that's true, the only time I would probably revisit that is if you've changed something in your process or methodologies that somehow make your white paper no longer valid. So, for example, if you said I measured this material or I visually inspected it at this step in the process. 
and you change the process such that that step is no longer there or reorder the steps, then you need to redo your white paper and re reevaluate. Uh, but if you've not if you've not changed anything, I don't see the, re the rationale for re-verifying that. Uh, you've written a really an intellectual argument that still stands uh, because you haven't changed your underlying principles behind that argument. Great, thank you. And uh, Gay, I just saw your note. We'll be glad to put you in touch with uh, our testing laboratory. Um, next question, what are appropriate tests to verify composition requirements? Uh, composition requirements. Um, so you would be um, needing to assay the, if you have multiple ingredients, you'll need to assay each of the different. So it's really redundant with strength, but you're talking about strength of the different components within that composition. So it's a bit redundant with that, but you need to, you actually need to measure strength of each of the components within that blend. Can I buy input all actives in a multi due to concentration lower than limit of quant quantitation and complex matrices? Uh, well, first of all, don't buy input. Um, so I hope you've, you've left that, you leave today seminar with uh, an understanding that you can't use that word. Uh, it's gonna attract FDA attention, but you can exempt it if it is true for every ingredient in there. You, you can't just, you know, wash the board and say it's true for everything. You do need to do your homework and establish that you uh, do not have a scientifically valid method, that you have other means to provide that assurance, uh, and then you document it and uh, get QA approval to that. And if that is true for everything in there, then yes, you can do that. But you can't, you can't just broad brush it. Uh, that will um, your scientific integrity behind that will be found wanting. For botanicals, are there requirements to prove the safety in terms of the absence of toxins, heavy metals, et cetera? Uh, pesticides, you do need to look for what is suitable and you establish your own specifications, but I would be looking for pesticide residue and I would be looking for heavy metals uh, for anything coming in from the raw materials. How does a certificate of analysis uh, tie in to reduce testing? A certificate of analysis. So again, that would provide supporting data for uh, reduced testing. Um, if, and I'm assuming in this case, you're receiving a finished product and you're saying, do I need to test? I have a contract manufacturer that is making a finished product for me and they provide me with a certificate of analysis. And by requirement, you need to um, uh, also test that product because you're accountable for that. So if you qualify that supplier and you show that they generate the same results as you do, and you've established that in your quality agreement, you can move to reduce the testing. Again, that's a discussion for an entirely different webinar but uh, you need to qualify that and periodically reconfirm that with your, um, uh, with your manufacturer. Perfect, thanks. We have time for one more question and I apologize to those that we did not get to, um, but uh, someone in the audience wants to know, how do you decide when you should be attempting an expensive method development versus creating an exemption? Um, Great question. Um, talk to your management, I would say. Uh, if, if you've done your homework and you see that, um, that there's no such method that exists and that people have tried and failed, you'd have to question why you think you might want to go down that same path. Um, uh, certainly, if you've got the documentation to say that others have tried and failed, uh, or others have not been able to do that, that provides a rationale for that. Um, but you do have to provide the necessary background to say that you attempted to do that. You at least reviewed the literature uh, to, to determine whether such method exists. 
Great. Thank you so much for such a great presentation and responding to so many questions. And thanks everyone for sticking with us. I hope that you have found this to be immensely helpful. I made some notes for those who've asked for additional information on various topics and testing uh, help. Uh, you're also welcome to respond to the email that I sent with the slide handouts if you would like to um, ask anything more specific. You do have Steve's email and uh, Tara Couch, who is our Senior Director for Dietary Supplements. Uh, we would love to work with you and, and help you in any of these areas and others that we can. Um, and thanks again for joining us. We look forward to having you at a future EAS webinar or seminar. And thanks again for your interest. Have a great day and thanks, Steve. Bye-bye.